part of it, then move on to the next topic. So we mentioned that the range of the aircraft is proportional to V infinity times CL over CD. This is the lift to drag ratio. You could think of it as a surrogate is Mach number times CL over CD, okay? At a CD times 1 over specific fuel consumption logarithm of weight at the takeoff, weight at the landing. So each discipline, they try to optimize it. Structures folks are interested in minimizing the weight at landing by making it a composite structure so that uh, you know the structure is light. You only have structure plus payload. So that's what you do. If you're Indiana Jones, you throw people off the airplane so you can go a little bit farther. You know, that also works, okay? Or you can carry a lot of fuel. You know, then you know takeoff becomes increases, but you could see it's a logarithmic effect. Okay, so if you have a ten times more fuel, log of ten is not a big number, so it's not going to increase the range that much. You could also improve the if you range by improving the specific fuel consumption. All the aircraft you had a jet engines, so basically they were pushing the high velocity flow like a rocket does. Uh, kinetic energy is uh, one half mv squared. Mass flow rate is mva. So the energy you are pushing out was mv cubed. You know, a lot of a uh, lot of uh, energy was being pushed out to produce the thrust. Then they found it's better to increase the a and uh, use a rotor or a propeller, take a large number of molecules and accelerate them by a tiny amount. Okay, so that's how. Helicopter rotors work, propellers work. You capture as many molecules as you can, so you increase the m dot. Then the delta v that you get, velocity in minus velocity out, is very small. Okay. So m dot times delta v is the thrust. Delta v translates into velocity cubed kinetic energy out minus kinetic energy in. So that's the reason for it. That's why jet engines now they use bigger and bigger high bypass ratio engines. One of the reasons is that, okay. So you can improve the specific fuel consumption quite a bit. From an aerodynamic perspective, you see L over D, that's the most important, okay. So we can get an attendance going from the back, please, okay. L over D. Sometimes you will see aircraft as you're flying, especially on long distances, slowly gain altitude, okay. So what happens is your weight is uh, decreasing as fuel is being burnt, one half rho v squared CL times S. So if you are flying at the steady level of flight at the, at the steady velocity, your CL will not be optimized anymore. V m infinity times L over D will not be optimized. Okay. On the other hand, uh, flying slower is not an option because it uh, not affects the Mach number drops. Also, the time time of transit uh, uh, is affected, so they will slowly climb to a higher altitude where the density is a little bit lower, and try to optimize operate at the best CL over CD. Okay, that's why you may start starting at 33,000. Sometimes it'll be like 38,000. Of course, there may be other <laughs> factors like weather and some other factors, but the primary reason when they take off and as they go towards the end of their range, they are going to this range. Then we said in transonic regime, CL tends to increase before it falls down somewhere around Mach 1. Whereas a CD behaves like this. Okay, so you have a critical Mach number. That's when you first get Mach 1 occurring somewhere on the aircraft. Then you have a drag divergence Mach number. 
a drag divergence Mach number, the rate of change of drag with respect to free stream Mach number is universally assumed to be 0 0.1, then the curve goes in this way. So let us say that somehow you could improve it with redesign to a little bit back, push it back. Then you have kept the CL behavior perhaps the same, but the CD rise has been postponed. When you do that CL over CD becomes dramatically higher, you are able to improve the range even higher. Okay? So transonic aircraft try to operate already taking advantage of the high CL that occurs in the vicinity of the transonic Mach number and relatively low drag. But if you could push the drag rise even further, then you have even better situation. So transonic flight is the most efficient flight for commercial flight, for maximizing range. And there are things, things could be done to go from a conventional aircraft to a better designed aircraft. So we mentioned the three concepts. The first concept is called <coughs> supercritical airfoil. So the, this airfoil we said would have a relatively flat nose, uh, pardon me, a blunt nose, uh, 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 a relatively flat upper surface thicker bottom side is to account, allow for the same thickness and some kind of a what they call a cove region, C-O-V-E type of a region. Okay. So the idea is ideally you will get a slightly above supersonic Mach number, so CP star, by, by the way CP star is P at Mach number 1 divided by p infinity minus 1 by gamma over 2 m infinity squared. How do you find p at Mach number 1? You find t star. t star over t infinity is known from isentropic tables. Then you can do p star over p infinity, plug it in, that is what the CP star is. Okay. So then you will try to keep this Mach number slightly above Mach 1. So it is still super critical, above the critical Mach number of 1 or supersonic. Then you try to compress it and then uh, you close the curve, Kutta condition still applies. Okay, so this is what you get. This S-shaped region of that pressure distribution is associated with this cove region of the geometry. Now, what happens is, um, if you get uh, greedy and push this too far back, then you are going from very low pressure to very high pressure over a very short distance. Pressure gradient will kick up, the flow will get separated. Okay, so you have an art to it. So where do you turn over, where do you start slowing the flow? Do you do it up here, up here, up here? It depends on how much is the pressure gradient, the boundary layer can tolerate without separating, okay? So that's what they would do. Okay. This is uh, under design condition. In an off design condition, what you would say is um, CP versus X over C. It may, you may get a shock near the leading edge, you may get another shock near the trailing edge, uh, but most of it would be similar in shape. You may get a small shear, leading edge shock because of the bluntness of the flow. The nose flow accelerates supersonically, then decelerates, then uh, stays supersonic to supersonic shock, then stays supersonic, then supersonic to subsonic shock, then it will come back down here. This would may occur in off design condition. So sometimes you will have a shock free flow. This is what you designed for, but in the real world, because of varying conditions, you may get a shock wave. As long as the shock wave is weak, as long as the drag rise is slow, you have accomplished your purpose. Okay, so this is the first concept we talked about. The second concept we talked about was called area ruling.
By the way, the supercritical error file was uh, developed by Whitcomb, Robert Whitcomb. Area rule also was uh, uh, explained by Robert Whitcomb. So he basically said, if I have an airplane, I'm going to take a slice of the cross section. Look at the cross sectional area. Here it is going to be just a circular body or some kind of a shaped body. Here it's a circular body. But when you take a cross section here, you're going to get a wing, fuselage, perhaps the bottom part of the wing. So this is the cross sectional area that you're going to capture. So this is called S of X. Okay. So Whitcomb said I'm going to plot my X versus S of X cross sectional area of X. It will start with zero cross section at the nose. It may end with a blunt cross section at the tailing edge if you have an engine. Okay, or if it's a bullet shaped body. But let's say for the sake of a discussion, it's a closed body. So it's going to start with zero, it's going to end with zero, but in between it's going to go through some bump depending on what you're doing to the body. So the second derivative, yes, d squared s dx squared, we will later on see, plays a big role in wave drag for wing body configurations. So this bump must be, anytime you have a rate of change of first order, first slope, Derivative of a derivative is going to be higher, so that's going to produce drag. Okay. So if uh, d squared s dx squared is minimized as much as possible, lowest wave drag occurs. So he, he would have said, uh, let's make it a little bit bigger here because we don't want to use a payload. We want to keep the same payload, a little bit bigger here. But let's take off some of the fuselage here to compensate for the increase the cross shakers area that the wing provides. Then, you know, go back to, you know, where it is. So if you have a smoother body, this is called the area ruled body. It's going to have a much smaller second derivative of cross sectional area, much lower wave drag. So this was his concept, okay, called area ruling. It could be mathematically proven in supersonic flow. Okay, so later on when we go to the supersonic flow, we will look at a drag of a body then you can asymptotically approach transonically, the same thing occurs. But when, when, uh, when uh, 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 Whitcomb did all these things, he didn't have mathematics, he had an intuitive feel for it. So this is what he did. Okay. Now the third approach, so this is also by Whitcomb, Robert Whitcomb, this is by Robert Whitcomb. There's a lots of PDF files, if you, you can go to NASA website and type Robert Whitcomb's area rule, you'll see lots of PDF files. Okay. So the third approach was from Germans, you know, during the Second World War, initially all the wings had a straight wing. Then uh, technology was improving, piston engine was replaced by jet engines, and after a while, the, all the German aircraft started having a swept back wing. You know, they had a very fast speed, very spar very good performance. You know, the dash speed was high. They could uh, uh, intercept, things like that. So people started looking at what's causing it. Of course, any good idea immediately is captured by other countries. So by, uh, from Germans to French to U Americans and uh, England, everybody started using it. So today we are going to see what's the physics behind it, why does it work. So this is the history behind it. By 1935, Germans knew about it. 1944 to 1948 was, the, as you know, the Second World War. 
So, there was some difficulty in a, in a migration of technology from one country to the other. But R. T. Jones at NACA, you know, predecessor to NASA had already pointed out the benefits. And lots of the aircraft, you know, by 1950s, they're using the sweep as a technology. So this is the principle. Explain it how at least this is how we can explain it. So let's say that you have a wing. It's a relatively high aspect ratio wing, swept back wing. Okay. So the free stream is um, um, in the free x-axis. The leading edge of the wing has got an angle equal to lambda. How we define the sweep differs. Many program, many software companies will say, draw a quarter card line, and then they measure the angle between the free stream and the quarter card line, normal to the quarter card line. Here we are doing free stream and normal to the leading edge because it's an infinitely swept wing. So therefore, the tape, there's no taper. So quarter card line is going to be parallel to the leading edge. Okay? That's what we're doing. Now, this sweep angle is called lambda. You know, you see angle. Now, we can, we can solve this by rotating it by lambda so that the leading edge happens to be along the y-axis like we have always done it for unswept wings, except now the free stream is inclined at an angle v infinity. That means the free stream has got a normal component v infinity times cosine lambda normal to the leading edge. It's got a tangential component v infinity times sine of lambda. So these are the two th components it's got. Now, we have been linearizing nonlinear potential flow equation in 2D except now we have to take the 3D version of the nonlinear potential flow equation and then uh, linearize it to see what happens. So this, because this is a 3D problem, information not just coming from one in the XY plane, there also seems to be a component of velocity in the Y direction, spanwise direction. But we take advantage of the fact that it's infinitely long in this direction Therefore, any derivative in the y direction has to be zero. Otherwise, it'll build up. Okay. If you have a point one foot inclination on pitch three road race, <coughs> by the time you reach the end of the ten kilometer, you'd have come up quite a bit, right? A thousand meter. So even a small slope will build up. So we assume that there's no y derivative whatsoever. Okay. That means once you take the three D potential flow equation. Any place where a y derivative shows up, I can throw that away, okay? cross, cross it out. Okay? So when you do that, this is, the, this is what we just said, we are going to throw it away. So any y derivative, get, get, we dis, uh, get rid of it. Then uh, our governing equation becomes, instead of a full six term equation, it's got x derivative, z derivative, and x z derivative. Okay. X is in the streamwise direction, z is perpendicular to the plane, y is along the span. Okay. This is what it is. This looks very similar to what we did before, so we can use the same technique for linearizing it like we did in 2D. Okay. Indeed, if you look at it, this is what we had in 2D, this is what we have in 3D. So, A will linearize into A infinity, U will linearize into U infinity, same thing happens here, okay. Except, for me, this would be Z, okay, I'm sorry, not Y squared, it will be Z squared. And this U infinity is the X component of free stream velocity, which is V infinity cosine lambda. Okay. Therefore, the governing equation has got a, this has the velocity v infinity cosine lambda, not the full v infinity. Therefore, when you look at the governing equation, it does not have the full Mach number, but it's got a Mach number times cosine lambda. So, by sweeping the wing, you have made the wing, trick the wing into thinking your Mach number normal to the leading edge is much lower. So, you may be applying at Mach 0.8 where the shock should occur, 
but let's say you have a 30 degree sweep cosine of 30 degrees is 0.866 okay so 0.8 times 0.866 is something like 0.7 so your wing thinks it's operating here okay so you have postponed the rise of drag this and in a nutshell is what's happening so the Mach number normal to the leading edge is lowered this postpones the drag rise reduces the compressibility effect delays shock waves is beneficial so this is a, all that is that is it you know it's a quasi 2d theory was what he used to explain it then when they came to, to practice by the way once you have this mark number this is what you would use to estimate the critical mark number okay yeah remember we had a practice problem in the, i showed the slide you would not use the full m infinity but m infinity times cosine lambda so at a higher free stream Mach number is when you will first hit critical Mach number, when you will first hit drag divergence. So everything will get pushed back. So the CL over CD ratio, therefore, will be dramatically improved by sweeping the wing. Okay, this is the third technique. Any questions on this? Are you all able to follow this? Okay. All right. okay. So R. T. Jones said, "Hey, why not an oblique wing?" If we continuously change the change the sweep as we go faster and faster okay change cosine of lambda so he said it's got some advantages because if you sweep the wing back you have pushed the lift back right because some of the wing is much for back therefore if you think of an airplane Normally, you want the weight to be upstream of the lift vector. So the lift vector is up here. <coughs> why do you know why this is? This is because of static stability consideration. Let's say you have a gust, vertical gust increasing the lift, then the aircraft will pitch down, reducing the angle of attack, decreasing the lift. It's kind of a static stability consideration. But if the left was too far back by sweeping the wing, then to stabilize this moment, your tail has to work up harder. Okay? So high sweep would mean lift vector being pushed too far back, then the tail will have to produce a lot of drag downwards. Tail is a lifting body, therefore it's its own induced drag. It may even have its own drag, wave drag. So all these things will compound. Okay. So R. T. Jones said uh, by using his technique, on some part of the wing the lift is tilted forward, other part of the wing lift tilted backwards. They kind of compensate each other. Okay. So it's this lift therefore comes very very close to this part of it because this is kind of a lift is acting in the forward. This is happening in the back. You test these things only over a desert, like a California desert, okay, Edwards Air Force Base, okay. And uh, any people who live down here have died from airplanes falling on them, so it's kind of a nice uh, empty space. So the benefits of oblique wing is it postpones shock. Structurally, also very simple. You know, the uh, uh, aerodynamic center is here. You could put it very close to the weight so that the tail does not have to work so hard compared to the other one. Okay. This is the oblique wing concept. Yes, sir. Could you please explain again how it postpones the shock, like what mechanism it's doing? Okay. The Mach number normal to the shock wave is the important thing. So by uh, some of the flow velocity goes span-wise direction. It's the same way as the swept wing. Yeah, it may, yeah in, okay. in the swept wing. Yeah. yeah, same way as the swept wing. Now, let's go back to the swept back wing. What is the benefit? We have already seen the Mach number normal to the leading edge is reduced, compressibility effect are reduced, shocks are postponed. These are good things. But one of the drawback is in the case of a swept back aircraft, boundary layer likes to follow the path of least pressure. And it likes to go from high pressure to low pressure. So it's not unlike the 
Qualls exam selection, you always try to find a path of least resistance. So you go to the lowest pressure. Remember, some suction peak on this wing is here. This wing section is here. Suction peak at this wing section may be here. Suction peak may be here. So there is no no uh, reason for the boundary layer to flow from left to right because it knows once I hit the suction peak, my pressure is going to start rising. So the flow now has got a three-dimensional, uh, another dimension it can flow. So it will say, okay, if the pressure here is lower than pressure here, why don't I flow sideways? So in 3D flow, 3D problems, sometimes you get a significant spanwise flow of the flow. But the farther the boundary layer travels, the more momentum it loses, the thicker the boundary layer gets. Therefore, by the time you reach the trailing edge, or in this case over an aileron, the boundary layer has got a very little momentum, very, very thick boundary layer. Okay. Now, let's say that you deflect the aileron, wanting to produce extra lift, roll the airplane. The boundary layer says, okay, you are deflecting the aileron. I have such a low momentum, I'm going to just separate. I'm not going to follow the aileron. So the aileron has become completely ineffective. So, if the aileons, uh, if for in highly swept wings, the separated boundary layer may cause the aileron to may become ineffective. So, one way people crudely prevented this was to put what they call boundary layer fences. Okay, they, you basically literally put metal structures on the wing that keeps the spanwise flow flow from happening. It forces the flow to turn around. So these are called the boundary layer fences. Do you all see it? Okay. This is the boundary layer fence, boundary layer fence, so forth. Okay. You don't see them in modern aircraft, you know, Boeing and so forth, because they have designed the wing to optimize the spanwise flow, try to keep it as much as possible. Um, uh, the pressure gradient would be running like this. So that when the flow component particle comes here. There's no reason to go for it to go sideways uh, here because it's going to see the same pressure rise as this one. It kind of tried to go in the direction of the flow. It's an art. They will look at the surface streamlines. They will look at CFT. They will design it. So modern aircraft, we no longer use boundary layer fences. By the way, on the airplanes, you'll see sometimes called the vortex generators, which are different than boundary layer fences. Vortex generator is nothing more than a little wing that you are stuck on top of the wing. Because it's a tiny wing, it produces its own tip vortices. So the tip vortices are, let's say this is the wing, this is my uh, vortex generator, it produces its own tip vortex. The tip vortex, because it's a swirling, uh, swirling uh, flow, takes the outer flow, uh, potential flow and pumps it into the boundary layer, try to keep the boundary layer attached. Okay? So if a wing has got a separated flow, let's say they discover it during a flight test or during the late stage of a wind, wind tunnel test, by the time they have already got the, a model being built, it's too late to change the design too late to fire the engineer because he has gone on to Georgia Tech to pursue a PhD. Okay. So what do you do? You stick a vortex generator. Basically, you are closing it. You are producing some disturbance in the flow that takes a high velocity flow from the potential flow outside and pumps it into the boundary layer, energizing the boundary layer and keeping it attached. But any such device has got a drag to it. So if you see a lot of devices stuck on this, that means it's a old generation aircraft or a poor technology aerodynamically. But the next generation, you know, when you go to the next generation of the wing, they'll do a lot of cleanup of the whole aircraft. They'll also redesign the wing. So by the time they go to the second or third edition of a 737, none of this will show up on it. Okay? So that's what happens. Okay. So boundary layer fence is here, sometimes also called the stall fence. And uh, this is the vortex generators, which are tiny devices. By the way, vortex generators can sometimes will be seen on the nacelle 
of an engine because uh, the region between the wing and the nacelle may get separated. Okay. So when that happens, you have a poor dra performance, drag increases. So how do you separate the uh, uh, flow? You inject a high energy air, air into that region, so you'll put a vortex generator. So sometimes you'll see on the side of a nacelle, little devices sticking out, this is the region for it. Almost look like a delta wing. So why not go to step forward wing like this? Because in the swept forward wing, the flow will go from the tip towards the leading edge or towards the root, keeping the ailerons, you know, which usually are the outboard portion of the, the wing because you want to put a lot of rolling movement, free and clear of any separated flow. Yes, it does that help, help in that manner. Unfortunately, swept forward wing have a, what they call a aeroelastic divergence. When the gust hits you, let's say when the gust hits you, the wing will bend, bend up this way and then it will pitch upwards. Okay. So when that happens, lift will increase, it will bend some more, twist some more, go like this, eventually it will break. So it's called a aeroelastic instability. Okay. Not a dynamic instability like flutter but a static instability. This is associated with a step forward. On the other hand, swept back wings, if a gust hits it, it will bend up, but it will twist this way. Okay. So angle of attack will decrease, automatically compensating for it. So this is why swept back is better from a static aeroelasticity perspective. So what people have come up with is composite structures. You orient the fibers so that you minimize this coupling between the bending and torsion to keep it from the adverse things from happening. So with modern composite structures, this instability could be avoided. Okay. So people have been looking at uh, swept forward wings. And then another thing they did was they said, okay, I'm going to put the tail in the front of it rather than the back, which is the canard. Then the tip vortex from the canard itself will act like a vortex generator improving flow near the root region. So it's a close coupled wing canard, you know, properly designed, can have a benefits near the tip, no boundary layer separation, and also benefit near the root because of the tip vortex energizing the flow in this region, okay. So this has been explored by a number of, uh, number of, uh, number of companies, number of uh, researchers. So that's the effect of sweep. So we had looked at three technologies. One is um, supercritical airfoil. Second is the area ruling. Finally, is the sweep effect of sweep. Okay. Now I have one last module in uh, this particular thing. <clears throat>